precious Heavenly Father, and you are so precious. We ask you, Lord God, to minister to us through your word. We need to have the armor of God on, and we need to put it on daily in order to combat the forces of darkness. They are strong, but you are stronger. They cause us to be weak, but you can rejuvenate us. Father, we are what you have made us to be, and we need you every moment. We cannot exist and have any victory in Christ without you being there supplying it. So, Lord God, we would pray that as we consider this very important subject of advancing through adversity, we will see and experience how that can become possible for each one of us that may be going through one adversity or the other. We thank you. And we praise you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. When it comes to adversity, none of us are immune. It isn't that, oh, I'm going through adversity and nobody else has ever gone through adversity. Only I'm the one going through it. No, no, friends. Adversity happens to every child of God. In fact, it happens to everyone on this earth that is born. But only the child of God can have a solution to how to deal with adversity. What does the world use as uh, dealing with adversity? They use drugs. They get high on a drug, and they try to forget their adversity, but their adversity is still there. They take alcohol to extreme, and they try to drink away their adversity, but it doesn't take it away. They leave the marital situation that is difficult, and they think they can escape that adversity, but they take it with them for their part of the problem. In every marriage, I've found out it isn't one person. It's two people that cause the adversity. And when someone comes to me and says, well, you counsel me, but they won't come with their partner, I say, I cannot. Because you see, it takes two people to have adversity, and it takes two people to have it healed by God. Adversity is something we all have then, but it's up to us how we deal with it. And only the believer in Jesus Christ has the rule book of how to deal with adversity. We all have experienced heartaches, pressures, anguish, hardships. It is a common thing to every one of us. Someone says the pastor is immune from adversity. You ought to be in my shoes. Adversity hits me just like it hits you because Satan is after everyone that believes in him. And adversity comes in strange ways, computer problems. That creates adversity. Getting a message and getting it ready and God saying, that's not it. That's not it. You don't think that's adversity when a pastor gets into the pulpit and you don't have anything but God gives what you need how can this message that I've read in five minutes last long enough to teach the people and then God anoints and he anoints and he anoints but the adversity comes in thinking I can't do this and then God says but you don't have to do it I'm here and I will speak through you Open your mouth. And that adversity every time is dealt with. Your adversity in your marriage can be dealt with by simply going to the one who knows how to deal with it, Jesus Christ, and following his example with Israel. 
Look, Israel was his wife, Hosea Goma, 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 excuse me, and Hosea. That was a, mar uh, was a marital situation that was worse than any marital situation most people have. And many marriages today, Christian marriages, want to quit. But God said, I won't quit on Israel. I won't give up on Israel. In fact, I will love her more and I will give her more grace and I will give her everything she doesn't deserve. And that is exactly what God does with Christianity. With every Christian, he gives us much more than we deserve. He is a God that loves without conditions. And he says his people must be a people that learn to love without conditions. Whatever heartache you have, whatever you're going through, perhaps it's financial, remember God has promised to supply all we need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Yesterday I had a funeral, and they paid me for the funeral. I didn't ask for it. I wouldn't have asked for it, but they did. And in the middle of the night, God wakes me up and says, what's a tenth of what you got? Well, I said, it's, it's this amount. Give it to Sunday school. But that means added to what I usually give to Sunday school, that's this figure. That's a lot, isn't it? And God says, yeah, it is, isn't it? God loves to teach his children, don't quibble with me, just tithe when I tell you to tithe, trust when I tell you to trust. In other words, simply do what you know you should do. And don't start questioning why I'm asking you to do it. God has a plan whether it's tithing, whether it's in a marital situation, whether it's in a heartache of one kind or another, God has a plan. Trust in God. Don't trust in your feelings. Don't trust in your income. Trust in God. And you know there are Christians who cannot trust in God, it seems, when it comes to their income. If I do that, I won't be able to do this. God has promised you. He'll take care of you. But if you don't, then God has not promised you that he'll take care of you. So whatever the problem, whatever the adversity, God says, I'm going to use that adversity to grow you up. Every one of us, the rest of our lives, has to grow in faith or as John DeBrine used to say on a radio broadcast, a great man of God, you'll groan in disgrace. Either we grow in faith and do what God tells us to do, or we don't grow and we groan a lot, and everybody knows you're a groaning Christian if you're a groaning Christian. You don't know what I've been through, Pastor. Pastor. God does. God does. Take it to the Lord and leave it there because God does. The reality is I had to do that this morning. Last week after I got through preaching, Satan attacked me. I got terribly dizzy. And Satan said to me, I'm going to do that again to you. And I said, Father, he said that, you stop him. And he will. He has. You see, don't let Satan threaten you in any way. When we had the funeral yesterday, Satan said, it's going to be cold. That wind's going to blow over that lake, boy. You know where the graveyard is. It's going to be cold, and everyone will be ready for you to stop preaching because they'll be frozen. 
It was warm because I wouldn't listen to Satan. You see, we need to listen to God more than we need to listen to the enemy who's constantly trying to give us adversity. Adversity comes from the devil himself, but God allows it so that we can mature when we turn the problem over to Jesus. When facing tribulation, adversity, we often wonder, where did this come from? We ask such a question as, is it my own doing? Did I bring on this adversity? And we start blaming ourselves, not even knowing whether we did bring on this adversity or not. But the devil tries to make us think it's your problem. You sin somehow. And that's why this adversity has come upon you. You can be very sure if you did do that and the adversity was a result of sin, God would tell you and he would not cause you to feel condemned all the time, but he'd give you the grace to repent. So what's this adversity from? Is it from something I did or is it something God wants to teach me? Note number one on the screen, if you will. Regardless of the specific source, ultimately all adversity that touches a believer's life must first be sifted through the permissive will of God. God doesn't send the adversity much of the time, but he has a reason for allowing it to come upon you. And his reason is a good reason. Satan has desired, Peter, to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. I'm not going to take that away. He will have his way, and I won't let him have his way. But after you have been sifted and go through this adversity, you'll strengthen the brethren. You'll build up the people of God. And that's exactly what happened. So God allows this in order to cause us to grow in some area of our life to trust him in some area of our life that we have never trusted him, to recognize that he has to be all in all to us or he's not at all in us and through us. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. Only trust him. How many times do we sing songs about trust and obey, or only trust him, or some other song that has the word trust in, and then we complain to people, I don't know if I can trust God in this situation. I don't know what to do. I mean, I break up into a frizzy. And have you ever seen the person, of course you have, you looked in the mirror, who's broken up into a frizzy, they're, they're just not balanced, they're they're totally negative, and it's all because they did not believe they could trust in God when they brought the problem to him. According to Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we cannot expect to understand what God is doing. But we have to trust him. I cannot understand what God was doing in certain situations I've gone through, but my trust has proven he had a plan. He had a plan. Even with our computer problems, with my wife's computer, he had a plan. He had a plan. He had a plan to minister to those people who were part of this group that repairs computers. They didn't charge us anything, and God said, I want you to do this. 
So I went and did what God told me to do, buy them a dozen assorted donuts, brought it to them, and you should have seen one of the guy's eyes lighten up. Who is nice enough to give something to us? It's more of a witness of Jesus Christ because they know exactly who I am. They call me a pastor horn, and I can tell you it's because of who I am and who you are that you've got to share the love of God with people in ways that blow their mind. They can't imagine. Why? 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 So one of the technicians said to my wife, you have any problems, just call me. I'll fix it for you. And I know it would be without cost unless it was a major problem. You see, when you minister Christ, people have a love for you that you they can't understand. They have a respect for you that they cannot understand. Why did that adversity happen? That was one of the reasons that adversity happened. And as you think about the adversities in your life, think of what took place after those adversities if it's been a while and you see how God used it in a beautiful way. And if you haven't seen it yet, hold on. You will see it in God's good time. So the word of God says, you may experience all kinds of pain and adversity, but wait on God. He has a plan. It's all for the sake of bringing you the next step in his plan of maturity. Number two, therefore, far more important than determining the source of our adversity, why it happened, is learning how to respond to it properly. You may never know why your adversity came upon you, but how do you respond to it? Do you respond to it the biblical way or the fleshly way? 90% of most individuals and a large percentage of Christians respond to it negatively. They blame somebody else. Nothing happens. No one can abuse you in any way unless God permits it for a future blessing for you. All things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are the call according to his purpose. That's not just a verse that we can say. It's a verse that we have to live by. We have to live by. Consider Joseph, one of the few people in the Word of God. There's not one negative thing said about Joseph, and yet he's characterized by one adversity after another. Now, Joseph had something he had to learn. He had pride that he didn't know he had, and his pride was getting in the way of God maturing him. So God allowed these things to happen in his life to bring him to a place of unconditional love. Pride makes you strike back. And he had, he had a right to strike back naturally against his brothers who put him into that position against Potiphar's wife that lied about him and ended up he ended up in jail. He had a right to hate his brothers, but God was reducing him to love. You may have a right to feel angry about some adversity in your life, but God is trying to reduce you and I to love. Love forgives before the person even says, forgive me. Love sees no evil. It buries it under the cross of Jesus Christ. It is interesting to note in the scriptures that God was prospering Joseph in the midst of his affliction. 
His afflictions were there, but God was taken step by step to get him into the place of authority next to Pharaoh that he never could have been. He could never have been there unless God had taken him through the steps of killing his pride. What does God have to kill in us? Every trial was part of God's equipping Joseph. Every trial you go through is part of God's equipping you and equipping me for every trial I go through. He became the deliverer of Egypt. A famine took the land, and the famine went into the land where the family of Joseph was as well, and they all had to come to Egypt. But you see, if God had not brought Joseph to Egypt through an adverse situation, a terrible situation, but God turns all the curses into blessings. And you remember that in your own life. If he had not brought him there, and he had not gone through one affliction after another, one adversity after another, he never would have become who he became in Egypt, and he never would have been able to counsel Pharaoh how to deal with what was going to come. They were in a time of plenty. They had all the food they wanted. They had everything. And Joseph counseled, You've got to save it. You've got to store much of it for there's going to be more years of starvation. Pharaoh listened to him. And at the proper time, God brought the brothers and they knew the only place to get some grain to deal with their famine was to come to Egypt. They came not knowing their brother was in charge and not even recognizing their brother because it had been so long when they came before him. But God reduced Joseph to tears when he told them who he was. They feared that he was going to kill them. Kill them. But Joseph's had his heart changed by the adversities he'd gone through. Don't you understand? Without an adversity, we don't really mature. And therefore, you look at adversities as saying, oh, God, thank you for that adversity. You're not asking him to send more, but you're thanking him for what he has done through your adversity. It's made you understand what somebody's going through that you never would have understood. It's made you a stronger believer in God's word than you ever had before. It makes you identify with people that are in a situation and you have been in similar situations and now you have identified with them and they feel encouraged and they desire to go on. The Bible reveals a number of reasons that the Lord allows difficulties in our lives. And perhaps it's one of those reasons that we're going to deal with that is the cause of him allowing it in your life. Not because of you being anything bad, but because God wants to take you another step up in usefulness for the kingdom of God. Number three, one of the primary reasons or purposes for adversity is to get our attention we're so busy in our day that it's hard for God to get our attention. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to go here. I got to go there. And God has to lay us low so that he can talk with us. When do I go to God? When the affliction comes. When do I have more time for God? When the adversity comes. You see, if I was tuned into God all the time, I'd have less adversities to have to go through. But because God says you're not tuned into me enough in order to take you the next step, you're tuned in, but not enough to take you to the next step. 
so I have to get your attention before I can speak with you. When my father, when my when God got my father's attention after the death of my mother, he bloomed. He bloomed. Before he was concerned to help my mother to deal with a situation that they had between them, and he loved her greatly, but when she was gone, he had to turn to God. He had to turn to God in full measure. His attention was on God fully, not on people plus God or his family plus God or husband or wife plus God. God said, now I've got your attention. I brought her home so that I could get your attention. That man blew up, bloomed like I've never seen him bloom in all the years that he was my father. He was a great man before that, but he was a sincere man in this greater way after that. You think that you are really mature. God knows there's a next step. There's a next step. There's a next step. When we stop growing, that becomes a problem. When I say, I know what's in this book, then I really am in trouble. God's going to teach us this book for eternity. Just the 66 books. And he's going to reveal probably to us all the other things he said and did while he was on this earth. And we think, I've exhausted the Bible. It's like a certain vice president that said he exhausted the Internet way back. No, he didn't exhaust the Internet. I've tried to, and there's no way. You learn something new every day if you're on the Internet. What to stay away from, what to go toward, what uh, to avoid, what to uh, listen to. Lately, I've been listening to some beautiful Christian music that comes from an academy where... They evidently train godly young people in music as well as singing, and I've been overwhelmed at the beautiful music and the beautiful scenery that goes along with it. I thought the Geethas were tremendous, and they are. But when you start looking and God brings before you some of these that I put on my site, you begin to say, oh, God, thank you. There are others that are committed to Jesus Christ. When you get a uh, uh, pastor, that was a great Bible study from an evangelist somewhere in the world. And I did remember, but at my age, you don't remember things. But he constantly listens to uh, us. There's another great man of God I knew in the Greater Grace Ministries. He's in the foreign mission field, and he's constantly watching our TV programs and commenting on them in a great way. You see, when you recognize we're not through going into all the world, we continue to go into all the world. All the adversity this church has been through is worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. All the adversity you've gone through because Satan would like to take you out of this ministry, it's worth it that you stayed in it because God has brought you into a maturity and there's a next step. There's a glorious step that God has for us. Saul of Tarsus, later known as the Apostle Paul, had a lesson involving pride too. Pride as well. Proud he was doing everything to rid this world of Christians. Before he got saved, he hated Christianity. He thought it was a cult, and he went around doing the best he could to stamp it out. He committed people to prison. He tortured people. He stood there saying, yes, stone Stephen to death the Christian martyr. Proud.
proud as a peacock. Sometimes I wonder how proud a peacock is. He's going down the road. He's going to another city, and his issue is he's going to find more Christians, commit more Christians to jail, kill more Christians, do everything he can to stamp out Christianity, and God's son says that's enough. Knocks him off his high horse. Makes him blind. And the only way he could get his sight, now God speaks to him, Jesus speaks to him from heaven. He said, why are you persecuting me? And he was persecuting God's people. So understand, when you get persecuted, it's God that's feeling it. And he told him who he was. And he was led to uh, the city he was going to to kill Christians. And he found himself in darkness. And he had to lose his pride because the only way he could get his sight back was by a Christian in that town praying for him. And when he humbled himself before God, the one he had persecuted, God gave him his eyesight back. You see, God wanted to change Paul's life. He thought he was religious, a Pharisee. He was the best of the crop, but he was following a false god. He was not following God and the person of Jesus Christ. So as a result of that, God said, I'm going to crush him so that he'll look up and the adversity will turn him into the greatest evangelist that there ever was. How do you know God's not going to great, your adversity is not going to cause you to be the greatest servant of Jesus Christ that there ever was. You don't know that. But God's not allowing it so it'll hurt you. God's allowing it so it will bless you and bless others at the same time. Number four, another way God uses adversity is to remind us of his great love for us his great love for us. The Word of God says no discipline is enjoyable. While it is happening, it is painful. But just as loving discipline is painful for God's children, it says a quiet harvest of right living results. Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6 say, My child, don't ignore it when the Lord disciplines you because he loves you, lets you go through a trial. Be encouraged when he corrects you, when he changes your direction. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. Don't put out that word, love. He disciplines those he loves. He lets you go through an adversity because he loves you. He loves and he punishes those he accepts as his children. God is in love with his children, and he wants them to be more like his son, Jesus. We sing the song, more like Jesus would I be. And then when, G, when God tries to create that in us, we say, you don't love me. We got problems. The whole head is sick. And the heart is faint, says the word of God. He wasn't just saying that about someone else. Unless we hear the word of God and are transformed by the word of God and live according to the word of God, we have a heart that is sick and a head that is not sound. Number five, if you are without discipline, listen to this, it's a very clear statement, you are an illegitimate child, not one of God's own. 
So if you're going through discipline or you're going through an adversity, it shows that you're one of God's children. Satan doesn't attack people that are his own. Why would he? He attacks people that are growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, have one desire to follow Jesus Christ and do it better every single day. Discipline happens to children that are loved. That means a lot of children in our world don't know they're loved because they don't get discipline. They rule the roost instead of be disciplined by a godly parent. Spare the rod and spoil the child is something that God has said in his word. But now if you, <laughs> if you spank a child, you're in danger of being taken up to court for abuse. Well, my friends, God is higher than the authorities. If they do that, they do it against God's word. You, you discipline them in love, always in love. But without discipline, you wouldn't have a pastor in front of you today. Not this one anyways. Because I had parents that believed in discipline, but godly discipline. And it made all the difference in the world. I never knew that I wasn't loved. I just didn't like the paddle. But the paddle corrected a lot of ill. And uh, maybe that's what has to happen to others that go to church today. They need a paddle of God. We all do at times. We all do at times. Number six, a third reason God sends adversity is for self-examination. Self-examination. When God allowed Satan to buffet Paul with a thorn in the flesh, the apostle prayed three times that it be removed. And every one of those times, God said, no. This is good for you. This keeps you usable. This keeps you humble. God may not have said that to you in your problem, but if God says that to you, go on. Go on and serve God in spite of your problem. If God wants to take it away, he will. But if God keeps saying no to you, and you only know whether he says no to you or not, no one has a right to tell you that. God will put it very clearly on your heart. Stop praying. This is good for you. My grace is sufficient for what you're going through. In the process, Paul certainly must have reached into his own heart and said, Lord, is it some sin in my life? And God said, let's just deal with with an affliction that you're going to have to trust me with. Number seven, when we encounter adversity, we would also do well to ask, am I in God's will? Not for condemnation, but just simply ask that, doing what he wants me to do. Am I doing what God has told me to do? God has given us certain directions Study the Word of God. Am I studying the Word of God? Assemble and do it much more. Am I assembling as much as I can? Use your talents and your gifts to further my kingdom. Am I using my talents and gifts to further the kingdom of God? Am I witnessing? As best you know how are you witnessing? These are the kinds of questions we ask God. And if God says you're doing all those things, just put your trust in him and realize God is doing something in your life, but it's to benefit you, not to bring any charge upon you. Number eight, a fourth purpose for God uh, has for adversity is to teach us to hate evil as he does. To hate evil as he does. You know, some people don't hate evil. 
even in the church of Jesus Christ, they don't hate evil. They tolerate evil. Every time I hear, whether I'm listening to television and uh, I hear it more when I'm in a restaurant or I'm somewhere where there are people, them using God's name. I was in a restaurant recently, and one word after another was God, God this, and God that. That hurts me. Now, in a restaurant, you don't go up to everyone and say, that offends me, because they'd put you out. But if it don't offend you, you're tolerating it. You're saying, hey, that's the way they talk. I knew a deacon, and he would use that name often, and it got me so balled up. I wanted to go to him, and God said, I'll correct it, and he did. But the thing is, you see, there are too many people that don't see evil as evil, and therefore, how can you imagine Jesus Christ dying on the cross for evil and for the sin that causes it to flourish? You say, well, then the cross wasn't as bad as I think it was. Evil. The world is getting more evil all the time. We look at the politics and the politicians and we say, well, oh, some of them are terribly evil. But have you ever noticed it's not just in politics? It's not just in government. It's all over. I was watching a beautiful show my wife and I last night on Hallmark, and it was a great show. The advertisements were horrible. Gays kissing each other, guys kissing each other. I mean, I, it was puking bad. And I said, you got to turn that off, Ellie, when that comes on. And she says, it comes on so quick, and it's off so quick, I didn't get a chance. And the show was beautiful. They are coming into more and more on these kinds of programs, whether it's Disney or whatever, stressing wickedness. And we say, well, it's not so bad. There was only one scene in that movie that was terrible. I told you about the Lone Ranger film that I saw many years ago now in the theater. And it was after the program ceased on television and they had this movie. And we walked out in the middle of it because they were cursing and swearing. Bandits cursing. I wasn't there for that. That is terrible. We don't get offended if we hear it enough. We should be so offended at evil that we flee it. We flee it. Just as Joseph fled Potiphar's wife, we should run from it as if it was the plague because it will start causing us to think it's not so bad. You know as well as I do, people put up with an awful lot that they used to not be able to put up with. Abortion, well, it's just a kid. It's a, not even a kid, you know. And uh, so... There's a group of people that they simply say, well, that's the way it is. No, sir. That is an offense against God's word. And nobody that is a Christian should say it's okay to go for an abortion with the exception of the very life of the mother if you can prove that it's the life of the mother being uh, threatened here. There are, if there are other exceptions, there are very few. But if you don't want the child, don't have the sex. And that's the reality. If you're going to enjoy the sex, and many of them outside of marriage, then take what comes, but don't destroy what comes because God has a plan for that child. If I was younger and I had the ability I'd take in all the babies I could just to escape the evil of our day. It's not new, by the way. This has taken place even in biblical days where they take unwanted children to the fire and they just kill them and burn them. Man's 
in humanity to man. And you're the light. Make sure you're a bright light. Satan sells his sin program by promising pleasure. And it is for a season. Freedom and fulfillment. But he doesn't tell you about the interest charges. Eve, wow, that is a delicious looking fruit. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat of it? Well, no. Isn't it pleasant to the eyes? Don't you think it's going to be delicious? And the woman goes by her emotions. That's why God put a man and a woman together so that they could be a balance. She goes by her emotions. She goes and takes it, and he goes by. He doesn't want to lose her, so he eats it too. And God says, Adam, you were in charge. Therefore, the sin is greater with you because you should have said no. And death is the result of him saying, yes, dear. Know when to say yes, dear, to your mate and no, dear. And most men don't say anything. Remember, the woman has been gifted by God with emotions and effect, uh, in uh, affection and caring, perhaps more than a man does. But the man has been given balance to balance that off so that they won't go into a tangent the wrong way. So a marriage made by God has to have both in it. I need my wife's affections. I need her, her uh, ability to feel another person's hurt. But she needs my balance so that she doesn't uh, sell everything she possesses and try to meet that need. See, there's a balance. By the way, she hasn't asked for that, so don't go up to her later. All right, so what did David say when he was afflicted? He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before God brought this upon me, I went the wrong way. So God puts a stop to me. And he says, now you're going to listen. I'm going to make sure you listen because you're my child and I love you. And I want you to listen to what I have to say. Whether it's this is good for you, trust me, or this is the sin that you've done and you must repent of it. But remember, it's all for our maturity in Christ. Number nine, a fifth reason God sends adversity is to cause us to reevaluate our priorities. Reevaluate our priorities. Many families fall apart. Adversity comes to them because the husband isn't giving the wife what she physically and emotionally needs. And so she feels she's not loved. That is not the right priority to have. My priority ought to be what will help this situation, this circumstance, in the best way, as God would lead me. My priorities aren't jobs. I remember uh, counseling an individual, and he said, I don't know why my wife is having problems. I'm working my head off. And she said to me privately, she said, I wish he'd spend more time with me. He thought the jobs and what he could get from the finances of it was going to meet her need. And she said, no, that's not what meeting my need. And he wouldn't believe her, and they ended up divorced. Many counselors 
have stopped counseling because they've given God's counsel and the person hasn't received it. So they've wasted their time giving God's counsel from his word, but the person says, I don't want to take that. Then they go to someone else who gives fleshly counsel, and they say, that sounds good to me. There's no goodness in a counsel that does not come from the throne of God. You want to know what's going to solve any problem you have in your need. It's called the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. Give a hand to God. All right, number 10. Another important purpose for adversity is to test our works, is to test our works. God already knows the outcome, and he knew it when he told Abraham to sacrifice his son. He knew. Now, God knew what would happen. Abraham didn't know what would happen. God did not test Abraham when he said, offer your son, your only son, the son of promise up to me. Sacrifice him. God knew he wouldn't do that. He had the lamb all prepared, a ram. But Abraham didn't know the depth of his faith. Abraham had to know the depth of his faith, faith to go on with God. The next step. We need to know how deeply are we in tune with Jesus Christ. And only through the test did Abraham know that. He knew he was willing to give up the dearest thing he ever had. The promised, promised son that the many stars, in other words, his ancestors would be beyond the count of the stars, the sands of the sea, it all relied upon his son that God said, I want you to sacrifice. It didn't make sense. All the other religions said, sacrifice your sons unto their God, and God always taught against it. Then God says to Abraham, I want you to do what I've always taught against. And Abraham went, but he went saying to his servants, we're going up on that hill to sacrifice to God, and my son and I will return. And he knew what he'd been told to do, and he was ready to do it. And when he got up there, he was in the process of getting ready to stab his own son and offer him when God stopped him. Abraham didn't know how far he'd go with God, but it was all the way. God already knew. God already knew. What does God have to do in your life or my life so that we come to that point of maturity? We'll just do whatever he says. When we know he said it, when we're convinced he said it, we'll do it. But we'll do it by faith. Number 11, his purpose was not to discover what the, res the response would be, but to show the patriarch Abraham where he was in his obedience to the walk of faith. How far are you along the walk of faith? He was nearing the end of it. He was mature. It took that test to show Abraham his maturity when Abraham came off that mountain, not only did he know more about God than he'd ever known before, he also understood more about himself and what he was willing to do. You notice it doesn't say he told his wife what he was going to do. Remember, she would go by feelings. You're going to what, Abe? Sometimes you can't tell your wife what you're going to do if you're sure it's of God, God will prosper it. But you better make sure it's of God. 
you better make sure it's of God. When God sends adversity into our lives, it's to test us. It is to test our family so that as the family looks at us, they will not see an individual that buckles, but one that remains walking by faith. Walking by faith. Number 12. As you face hardships, keep in mind that its intensity will not exceed your capacity to bear it. Its intensity will not exceed your capacity to have victory in it. God never sends adversity into your life to break your spirit or to destroy you. If you respond to adversity improperly, you can destroy yourself, but God's purpose is always to mature you, to cause you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Adversity touches every life. Instead of us simply running away from it and asking the Lord, what are you, we should ask the Lord, what are you trying to teach me? What do you want me to do? And when we find out that God wants us to simply trust him, then we simply ask God, give me that kind of trust. There's nothing I can do on my own. I have to receive it all from God Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. Your word, Father. Not the word of a pastor. Not the word of some theologian. It's your word. Help us, Lord God, to live in trust to you. As we face adversity, help us not, Lord God, to cave in, but to be men and women that walk by faith and the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. As you are listening to this and you're on the Internet or you're on public access, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? I've heard so many people say, I hope so. No, no, no. You don't have to hope for it. I know so for myself. How do I know so? One day I said, Jesus, forgive my sin. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. From that day on, I became a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do you now know Jesus as your Savior? If you have not asked him to do that in your life, will you do it right now? Say, Repeat it after me. Dear Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my life and be my Savior. I will serve you the rest of my days. I will read your word, the Bible, and through your power, I will live according to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you as you do that. If you have received Christ as your Savior, please let us know. We want to rejoice with you. You can get in contact with us by going to our, our internet connection, rhornet2 at metricast.net. That's rhornet2 at metricast.net. And if you're in this area, the area of the United States, you can simply write to us at this address, The Bible Speaks, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire. Zip code 03246. God bless you as you do that. Will you turn with me for our closing hymn for the TV program? And it is, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. 7.32, let's stand. 
In heavenly armor we enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. Battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And the last, when your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, Power and strength to the Lord. God bless each one that's been watching us on TV or the Internet. Have a great week, and we're waiting for your response to the Word of God. Let us know. Have a great day.